Well, I, I trust that what I will bring today will be of some value to you this morning. I believe it will be. I feel like I'm a mile away from you guys. Can I, can I join you down here? There we go. That's better. <laughs> Don't like being so far away. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. It's been a while since I've been able to be here, but uh, it's always it's always wonderful, and I'm very grateful for the invitation, uh, Peter, to, to come and share the word with you this morning. And so let's pray, and we'll jump right into this and, uh, and believe that the Lord is going to leave you with, with something of, of tremendous value. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that we are tremendously privileged people uh, to have the, the power of your word that is available to us. So, Father, open our hearts and our minds this morning to be able to hear, to be able to hear your word, to be able to activate that word in our life and see the tremendous value, Lord, of what you have given us in your wisdom, in the beauty of your words, in the power of your word uh, in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, that's precisely what I want to do this morning, is to actually just focus on the Word of God. And I'll explain why as I get into that this morning. And as I was searching for a title, I tend to kind of be gravitating towards fancy titles that kind of, you know, have a spin on things or sound exciting, and nothing came to mind. In fact, really, it just kind of boiled down to the simplicity of really what I feel like the Lord is wanting me to share this morning. And so the title of today's message is simply The Word. Just The Word. And as I get started this morning, uh, I want to just reveal, I want to read some passages of Scripture to you that I think uh, underline what I'm trying to say about the beauty, the power, and the, applic the application of God's Word uh, to us in our lives. But before I do that, how many of you enjoy uh, maybe going for a walk, particularly in our area that we live in, such a beautiful area, and just seeing the mountains? Right? How many of you enjoy just having those times where we get to see nature? And, and when you do see nature, there's something about it that is just not only breathtaking, but it also just, it, it relaxes your soul. You just are able to just see the, the beautiful vista of the mountains or the lakes or the forests or what have you. And just, ah, you can exhale, you can relax. There's a sense that, that no matter what is going on around us, all the chaos around us can just kind of melt away as we are just able to get our focus on the beauty of that which surrounds us. And in fact, th th that, that reality is something that I think, no matter whether you're a believer or not, I think many people who are not believers, they're just able to even just get away, look at the creation of what God has made and just whew, relax, experience God's presence. And in the same way that we are able to do that in the physical world, I think there is something about the actual Word of God that has the same power. Because interestingly, as we're going to look at this morning, it is His breath, His Word, that creates the majesty of creation actually begins right here in the Word of God. And so if, if we're out looking at the majesty of creation and we think that that is so awe-inspiring and so beautiful and so uh, relaxing, and it is, how much more when we just behold His words? We, we live in times where truth is under attack. We live in times where we are surrounded with such confusion and in a time which is it's really oxymoronic in a way because we live in a time where information is so readily available to us and yet we are so confused as to what truth actually is. It results in an era, I think, that has contributed largely to this sense of lack of mental health. 
Our, our mentalities, our mental health is, is so low at a time where information is so abundant. Perhaps it's because in the midst of all that information, we're not actually seeing the truth. If you like, just close your eyes for a moment and just listen to the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. For your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that for which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for that for which I sent it. So, faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. And if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Aren't those powerful words? Just a whole collection, a, a conglomeration of different scriptures from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, from the Psalms, from the Gospels, from the Epistles, from, from Proverbs, from every different aspect of the Word of God, we see that the power of the Word of God is what gives us not only hope, but it gives us life. This morning as I get into the Word of God, I want to not only talk about what the Word of God provides us, but also for us to recognize the very power of the Word of God. 
as we are able to enjoy it. Sometimes in these days and in these seasons, you know, it's very difficult, as I alluded to earlier, with all the confusion that surround us and with, with the bombardment against truth that we find in our culture and all the difficulties that we experience in our life and our circumstances, the question that we are often kind of reminded by is, is where is God? Where is God in all the chaos? Where is God in the breakdown? Where is God in the midst of all the, the difficulty that I'm experiencing in my life? Where is, is God in the midst of the, the, the economic uncertainty? Where is God in the midst of the political uncertainty? Where is God in the midst of, of my marriage difficulties, as we saw in that video that we're being encouraged to, to be sharpening our understanding of what that looks like? Where is God in the midst of all that? And this morning, I want us to just come to a very simple understanding that God is in our midst very simply when we do this. Did you see what I just did? In case, you're, in case those of you can't see it on the, on the video. It's as simple as that. God is present to us in his word. We, we look for him sometimes in all the circumstances. We look for him sometimes in this and that. And he does show up in all of that. But sometimes we get confused. Sometimes we get disillusioned because we're looking, we're searching, we're, we're seeking, and we just can't find him. And sometimes it's just as simple as, have you turned to my word. I want to focus this morning on 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church and he's speaking to them at a very specific time, a time of promise, a time where destiny is unfolding. This is the beginning of the New Testament church era. And the Corinthian church was certainly going to become one of the most vibrant, strongest, most powerful communities of believers in the Roman world at that time. And so what is the word that Paul is going to give them that is going to help them to kind of contextualize where they are, what God is doing, and where their future is heading to. And ultimately, God points them back, or Paul points them back to their history. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, Paul relives the story of the Exodus. And I, I would say probably more than any other story from the Old Testament that we see in the Word of God, the story of the Exodus is probably one of the most profound stories of what God is wanting to do in our life in terms of bringing us out of chaos, bringing us out of bondage, bringing us out of the world system, and putting us into a new place of hope. It's a powerful story. And I want, to see, I want you to see here how Paul kind of summarizes that story. He says, I, I don't want you to forget, verse 1, I don't want you to forget. In other words, get into the Word of God because it is by getting in the Word of God that we do not forget. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the clouds and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses, and all of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Okay, Paul, great. Thanks for, for giving us that story again. It's wonderful. It's, we're, we're excited by it. It's a, it didn't happen to us, but we can, I guess, relive this vicariously through reading the Word. But, but you know, it, it's, uh, what does that mean? It's, it's something that was for them, but, but is that true for us as well? And listen to what Paul says next in verse 11. He concludes saying, these things happen to them as an example, 
but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Listen to that very carefully because he says, these things happen to them as an example. So in other words, they, they had the wonder of experiencing that incredible Exodus moment. Okay? But in one sense, the power of what they were experiencing, it wasn't just for them alone. It was also for those who are coming much later who wouldn't experience it in the now, but it would experience it in a different way in an age to come. So in other words, what Paul is saying is, as you remember, as you go back and see, the power of that story isn't just for them, but it's written down as an example for your instruction in the now. Their experience crossing the, the Dead Sea, the Red Sea, their experiencing with the parting of the waters, their experience with seeing you know, a Pharaoh's army drowned in the midst of the Red Sea, their experience is for you too. It's for us right now. The word there that Paul uses, these things are written down for our instruction. The word instruction there in the Greek is nuthesia, which is to call attention to. It refers to the intellectual faculty of perceiving, considering, and judging calmly. I love that. In other words, this story is given for our ability to perceive, to consider, and to judge Calmly. In the midst of the chaos that we find, we, we find our own pharaohs running after us, screaming to take us down, to hold us back, to, to keep us trapped in Egypt. And in the midst of that, we find God's word as an instruction to us that helps us to perceive. Am I perceiving that the worldly ways of thinking are wanting to hold me back, keep me away from my destiny? Am I not only perceiving, but as the word says here, to instruct is also to to, 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 to consider and to judge calmly. Everything in our world is frantic and, and making you come to a place where make decisions, make it now, make it quick, just act, do, quick, get on with it. Live in the rush, the hustle, the everything else. And when God's word to, comes to me, it gives me the power to stop, perceive, recognize, judge calmly. And out of that, wisdom flows. Strategy comes. New paths open. Paths through a Red Sea that... Hello? Deliver us from bondage and lead us into a promised land. Reading the Bible narrative develops our capability, I think, to perceive and to consider and to judge calmly. But, but why, was, was, why was this necessary for them at this time? Why was Paul speaking this to the Corinthians at that time? I think it has a lot to do with the context in which they find themselves. And it's interesting because you look a little bit further on in that, in that verse, in verse 11. He says, these things happen to them as an example. They were written down for our instruction. And he says this, on whom the end of the ages has come. Well, why do you say that? I mean, the sentence could have concluded very easily, these things happen to them as an example, and they were written down for our, our instruction, period. And that would be good enough. But that's not what he's saying. For our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. What does he mean by that? I mean, clearly that didn't mean the end of time because that was, what, at least 2,000 years ago and here we still are today. On whom the end of the ages has come. The end of an age conveys this idea of both definitive and conclusive moments in our lives. The end of an age is a, a defining moment in life where one 
period of history or one transition in life is ending and a new era, a new season is shifting and becoming a new reality. And for the Corinthians, that was exactly what was happening. They had been in a, in a, in a pivotal moment in time where they were moving from the Old Testament era where God related to his people uh, in a nation to now where we were entering into a period where God was entering into a relationship with his people through the church. There was a pivot. There was a new season that was coming. There was the end of one thing and the beginning of another. So in other words, it wasn't just sufficient, although it would have been fine to say, hey, these things were written down for our instruction, period. But it was more powerful for Paul to say, because you're living in a season of transition. And if you think about it, the people of God coming out of Egypt, it wasn't that this was the exodus period. Just get you out of Egypt and over to the other side where you can be free from that system. No, there was a whole promised land that they were heading into. In other words, the Exodus story was a transition from one thing to another. God doesn't just rescue us. He leads us into something else. And it's the power of God's word that is not just about a word that rescues us. It's a word that is the power, has the power in it to create something new. So as this morning, as we think about the word of God, I want to encourage you that we not only think about the word in terms of it rescuing out of your sense of disillusionment, rescuing you out of sin, rescuing you out of all the things that trap you and ensnare you, rescuing you out of a place of, of, of wondering what you should do. The word of God is strategic. It opens doors. It leads us in. It pushes us in to a new life that we have in Christ. But that's not it. It's even more powerful than that. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2, speaking again in this New Testament era that the Corinthians are walking in. Hebrews says this, long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And that was wonderful. And that was sufficient. But he goes on, he says, but, in case you thought that was enough, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And who is this son? None other than the word made flesh. John makes that very clear for us. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So in other words, as much as it is powerful to go back to what I was saying as Paul was su suggesting that in the, in the example of the story of the Old Testament, we find instruction, we find that which helps our mental faculties perceive things and judge things calmly and find truth and all the rest of it. All of that is wonderful, but that even that is not sufficient. There's something even more powerful than just having our mental faculties come to life. As wonderful as that is, it's more. As we read the word of God, we come into the presence of God because the word of God is Christ. And as we enter into the words, we are entering into his presence. 
So that's why, you know, I kind of did the visual demonstration. We're wondering where God is in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of the disillusionment and everything else. And it's as simple as opening the Word of God because by it, not only are our mental faculties being renewed and uh, being, being, uh, you know, being found to come alive and all the rest of it, but we actually come into the presence of Christ. It's in the Word that we find his presence. In the New Testament era, the purpose in reading God's word is is not just to provide us with the intellectual capability of perception and reasoning, although that certainly will help, but also to experience and engage the transformative presence of Christ's character among us. N.T. Wright, one of my favorite theologians, says this, the word was announced as a sovereign summons and it brought into being a new situation, new possibilities and a new life-changing power. I'll read that again. It's so powerful. The word was announced as a sovereign summons and it brought into being so much more than just a kind of an intellectual understanding. It brought into being a new situation, new possibilities, and a new life-changing power. The Word of God, as found in His presence, provides us with a sense of identity, security, guidance in an age otherwise defined by insecurity and confusion. N.T. Wright goes on to say, it is enormously important that we see the role of Scripture not simply as being to provide true information or accurate commentary upon the work of God in salvation, but as taking an active part within that ongoing purpose. So in other words, we we read the Bible not just as a manual to, well, Lord, explain to me what, what this salvation is and explain to me what this new life in Christ is. It's like, no, it's not the explanation manual. It is the experiential manual. It's how we experience it. An explanation is important, but we need an experience. Isaiah, I think, foresaw this when he says in Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11, for the rain and snow come from heaven and do not return there, but they water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout. In other words, he's giving an analogy here about the power of God's word. He goes on, he says, it gives seed to the sower. It gives bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish. It shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. It does not say it shall explain My word shall go out from my mouth, and it shall explain that which I purpose. I mean, I think the word of God does do that. But it says, it shall accomplish. There is a power to God's words that when we read it, when we take the time to ponder it, when we take time to meditate on it, it has a power that has the capability to transform who I am, not just transform my thinking, but transform my identity, transform my purpose, transform how I interact with people, how I work, how I engage in relationships, and so on and so forth. Five things that the Word has the power to provide. Number one, it provides guidance. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
So in other words, when we are in that place of darkness, we can't see. We, we're not sure what the path is. We're surrounded by, by the darkness of, of all that is going on. The Word of God is that lamp to our feet. It may, it may just shine a little bit at the, at, the, at the immediacy of where we find ourselves, but that's all we need. We find sufficiency in God's Word giving us guidance in the moment that we find ourselves in. Secondly, it provides wisdom. Proverbs 8, verse 8 to 11. My advice is wholesome. Choose my instruction rather than silver, and knowledge rather than pure gold. For wisdom is far more valuable than rubies. Nothing you desire compare with it. So in other words, what's the value that you attribute to the word of God? There are many things that we attribute value to in our world, particularly in our Western world. We attribute value to money and to physical things. And certainly those things do have value because they have purpose. Value is defined by the purpose which we find for that very thing. And it's not that we denigrate as, as Christians money or anything like that. There is a value to money. Value is uh, Money is a tool that helps us to accomplish things that we need to do in our lives. Provides the shelter, provides the clothing, provides the food. It's a tool. Okay. Do we recognize the value that is on the word of God in the same way that we see that there is value in money, that we are striving after accumulating the wisdom in God's word just as much as we go to work every day because we find value in the money that we're acquiring because we need it to run our families. Thirdly, it provides freedom. Psalm 119, verse 45, I will walk in freedom, for I have devoted myself to your commandments. There's a beauty of finding the freedom in God's word because it gives us a sense of security in what we know is true, what we know is right, what we know we can do, what we know is going to bring blessing. And so in that sense, we're not bound up in uncertainty that, that robs us of our freedom. It is certainty that gives us freedom. And God's truth is that which is certain, that which we can bank upon, and therefore that which provides us with freedom. Fourthly, it provides us with comfort. Psalm 119, verse 50, verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promises give me life. This is my comfort, that your promises give me life. When we're dealing with the difficult circumstances that we might find in and we feel the discomfort of those circumstances, are we looking to change the circumstances? Are we looking to provide the certainty of God's word in the midst of those circumstances that will provide us with comfort? Knowing with certainty that God is sovereign, knowing with certainty that he is in control, knowing with certainty that there is a purpose to the difficulties that we find ourselves in. That is what provides us with comfort. And fifth, the word provides resilience against temptation. Psalm 119, verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When we're tempted to choose our own way, it is the word of God that provides us with a foundation upon which we can base our decisions, which we can default back to. Knowing that sometimes when we're faced with a difficult decision because there is something that maybe that we want to do that we know is destructive, we need something more than just our mere willpower that we can revert back to the strength of the Word of God, that God's Word in me, residing in me, is going to give me the power to overcome that temptation. Because the reality is, is temptation 
It plays on your willpower. Temptation is the wrestling of your will between, well, I, I want to do this and I, I know I want to do that. Like Paul says in, in Romans 7, it's that struggle between the, the flesh and the spirit. You know, if we let it just be a battle between the will, more often than not, because sin resides in us, we're going to default to that which is easy. We need something in us that's giving us the power to choose what is right. And that is the word of God. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So how do we get into God's word? I want to give you three practical things that you can do to experience more from the word of God in your life. Three things, a devotional approach. Secondly, a wisdom approach. And thirdly, a narrative approach. A devotional approach clarifies our values. The wisdom approach clarifies our thoughts. And the narrative approach clarifies our directions. Devotional approach, reading a psalm perhaps each morning as a way to experience devoting your hearts and your thoughts to the Lord. N.T. Wright says the Psalms are inexhaustible and deserve to be read, said, sung, chanted, whispered, learned by heart, and even shouted from the rooftops. They express all the emotions we are ever likely to feel, and they lay them raw and open in the presence of of God. That's just worth reading again. I just love the way N.T. Wright says this. The Psalms are inexhaustible and they deserve to be read, said, sung, chanted, whispered, learned by heart, and shouted from the rooftops. Can I get an amen this morning? And why is that? Because they express all all of our emotions, and, and we need to be able to express all of our emotions. The only way that we can submit our emotions to the Lord is by letting him know what they are. So, well, I'm going to submit my emotions to you, Lord. I'm just going to kind of quietly, discreetly kind of, you know, keep them secret from you because, you know, I don't want to, you know, I, I know that my, my emotions are a bit raw right now. You probably don't want to know them. No! Shout them from the housetops. Lay them bare before God. Read these Psalms like David did when he was in despair, when enemies were coming after him, when he was in temptation. He let God know exactly where he was at. God was not afraid to see David's emotions. God's not afraid of anything, let alone our emotions. He can handle them. Sometimes we may not necessarily want our emotions to be made known to others because it might cause confusion or chaos or what have you, but there's nothing to stop us from revealing our emotions to God. We need to do that. As you meditate on the, on the Psalms, ask yourself some questions. In fact, for each one of these three um, applications, the, the, the devotional approach, the wisdom approach, and the narrative approach, I'm just going to ask you to do a few, uh, just going to give you a few questions for you to ponder. So when, when meditating on the Psalms, ask yourself, how is God presented? Am I seeing how he's presented? How, how do I see his character? How do I see his actions? And secondly, how is man revealed? What are his shortcomings? What are his responses? What are his feelings? What can I learn from that? How can I um, relate to that? How is God presented? How is man revealed? In the wisdom approach, where our, our thoughts are clarified, I encourage you to, to read a proverb or read a chapter of Proverbs a day or some of the other wisdom literature from the Bible. Proverbs chapter 8. Uh, let me just turn there real quickly. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 14 through 18. Wisdom speaking here. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insights. I have strength. By me, kings reign. And rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule, 
and nobles, all who govern justly. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness and in the paths of justice. That's Proverbs 8, verse 14, speaking about the role of wisdom in our lives. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 33 says, Whoever listens to me, that is to wisdom, will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread or disaster. How many times do we find our ourselves wanting to be in a place of security or in a place of ease. It doesn't mean that life is always going to be easy, but it means that we are able to approach the situations that we find in our circumstance from that place of ease. Why are we able to do that? Because we know that God is at work and we know that he has given us, as the word of God says, he has given us everything we need to walk in his ways. And so we're able to rest in that. Whoever listens to, to me, wisdom, will dwell secure and be at ease. So some questions to ask as you're meditating on Proverbs. What do the specific words imply? Think about them. Don't let them just kind of gloss over your head just as you're quickly, you know, I'm reading my psalm for the day and my proverb for the day, or I've done that on with the coffee, on with, you know, scrolling through Facebook or whatever else it is. Meditate and ask yourself, what do these words mean? What conviction does the proverb bring to my life today? How should this proverb be applied in my life today? That takes time. It takes time to ponder and to think and to slow down. The last approach that I want to just touch on this morning is the narrative approach that helps to clarify our directions. It's the power of story. It's, it's finding the stories, like, for instance, what I gave you this morning from Exodus. In fact, if we actually go back uh, to the book of Exodus, I want to just read just how powerful it is. If you look with me in Exodus chapter 15, the song of Moses as they come out, uh, you know, from the from the parting of the Red Sea. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, "I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. This is my God." And I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. And he goes on in verse 13, he says, You have led in your steadfast love the people you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots, verse 19, and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. What a powerful story. Okay. You know, are, we, are we availing ourselves of these kinds of stories? And this is just one out of probably hundreds, if not maybe thousands of stories that we find in the Old Testament that provide us with life, that provide us with hope, that provide us with security, that provide us with a sense of certainty, you know, that you can picture your own minds. Like, I, I feel sometimes like I'm stuck in Egypt, or I've got the world just chasing at my back. And in those times, I need to turn to the Lord and, and look at the, the word and, and, and be able to say like Moses, say, I will sing to the Lord for his triumph gloriously. He's my strength. He's my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. Several questions as you meditate on the story. First of all, can you summarize the story in your own words? 
get it into your sense as to what this story is about. Who are the key characters? And I'm not just saying this from an intellectual standpoint. Well, who are the main characters? Moses, you know. No, no. Explain who they are. What are their shortcomings? What are their strengths? How do you relate to them? What are the key aspects of who these characters are? What is the general principle that can be derived from that story? How does that story apply to your life that's going to cause you to see and act differently? So those are just some questions for you to to posture yourself, for you to consider as you think about various different ways that you can engage the Word of God from a devotional approach or from a wisdom approach, or from a narrative approach. And you know best in terms of what do you need on a day-to-day basis, what you need at this particular season in your life. Or maybe, you know, the Word of God is like a kind of a multivitamin, in a sense, you need a little bit of everything, you know, every day. You need the psalm, you need the proverb, you need the story. You know, whatever you feel led in terms of what you need, but I am telling you this morning that the Word of God, if I can summarize it this way, provides us with two things. It provides us with that instruction, like Paul says. This happened to them as an example, was given for our instruction. It helps us to be able to perceive and to be able to see and to be able to think clearly. It arrests our mental faculties. And our mental faculties need arresting from time to time because our our mental faculties can just run wild. They can be unbridled. And when our mental faculties are unbridled, they can easily be infiltrated by the enemy that sows seeds of doubt and confusion and and self-doubt. And you're not worthy enough, or you're not working enough, or you're not this enough, or that enough, or it's too chaotic. And our our mental faculties kind of run wild with, with whatever. And the Word of God provides us with a standard of of what is true that we're able to ponder and consider and, and think about the reality of what's true. It's the first thing that God's Word does. And secondly, as I alluded to, the Word of God provides us with the the power of accomplishment. It doesn't just arrest our faculties. It goes before us and creates new circumstances. When God's word resides in us and is that which comes out of us, we begin to speak principally uh, in a principled fashion. We begin to, to speak in a way that brings reconciliation to relationships. We begin to speak in a way that, that solves problems. And in that way, The same way that when God's word speaks, things happen. When God's word speaks through you, it has the power not just to inform, it has the power to change. So this morning as we close, I want you to be challenged to think about the word in those terms differently. Particularly as we are surrounded perhaps even infiltrated with confusion, disillusionment, being overwhelmed by circumstances, that we are reminded to slow down, think, ponder, and meditate on God's word that has the power to change us from the inside out. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. That was a good word. Amen. You know, I don't know, maybe I'm just old-fashioned, but I don't like reading the word off my personal device. I do it when I don't have my Bible around, I need to find something, but... You know, there's something about taking a Bible in your hand and paging through and reading from the Scriptures. Now, call me old-fashioned. Well, that's what I am then. But thank you, Simon. That was amazing. 
All right, before as all gets set up, there's a few things I would, would like to do. The first thing is that we have a bittersweet celebration today. Our dear Annie is retiring, and so I wanted to come up. She's been with us 17 years, faithfully serving each one of you. Amen. You've probably had a call from her a few times, maybe plenty of times, but she is retiring. I won't tell you her age, but she's 79 years of age. It's been a joy having her in the office every single day because, you know, one thing she's never done is grumble at me. She might have grumbled under her breath or when she's driving in her car, but she's never grumbled with me once. And it's just been a joy. And she, she was first the accountant and then she was doing uh, care for the congregation. And so I'd like some of you just to come up, stand around her and we pray for her. And the other good thing about it, she had the idea of going to go and live in Italy but we are blessed that she's staying with us. It just seems the right thing to do as a family to have her close by. And when I say family, I talk about you as well. You are her family, you are her community. And you know, that's what church is about. It's about community, it's about family, it's about being together. It's about being able to pick up a phone and rely on somebody else to come and do something. And so, would somebody like to pray? All right. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for the heart of Annie. Lord, her heart is your heart. She just the joy of her serving this family is um, a blessing to all of us. Thank you for her heart. Thank you for the way in which you move and that you work through her. Thank you that she will still be here with us. Lord, we ask your blessing on her for this new journey that she's about to begin, this new part of her life. Lord, we pray you'd continue to bless, allow her to serve in different ways, in ways in which only you can do through her because of the way you've created her. We thank you for her, the beauty with which she serves. What a testimony to you. And so we ask that you would bless her going forward, behind and before and after her in Jesus' name. And so after the service, we have a potluck. And we would invite every single one of you to hang around. And uh, we have a cake for Annie as well. So just hang around and partake in the potluck. And so we look forward to that. Now, as you know, we started Rooted this week and we started Rhythms this week. If you missed out, if you forgot about it and you'd like to get in the class, there's still time to do that. So next week, 9.15, Rooted and Rhythm starts. And then the marriage course starts on Wednesday. It's online from 8 o'clock in the evening to about 9.30. Go on to our website where you can sign up, get the material you need. Now, it's not only for young married people. It's also for us who've been married a while. And I hope Gabby's going to learn something out of us We're also going to get on to it, and I hope she's going to learn something from this marriage course. <laughs> Me? No, what do I need to know? <laughs> By the way, I'm, I'm so glad I got back in one piece, because driving in Italy is chaos. They come literally 
this close to you behind as you're driving down the highway, they almost force you. You can't even see the badge of the car behind you because he's that close to you. And they just drive like absolute maniacs. And the hands are flying in the whole nine yards. <laughs> so I had up-to-date repentance every single day in case I met Jesus at any moment driving in Italy. <laughs> And next week, we pick up on the book of Revelation. We're going to look at Revelation 7 and 8 for next week. So, how many of you appreciate this worship team? How many appreciate the word that Earl brought? The seven aspects of worship. And then Noel came. And he filled in for his father, and I think he did a good enough job, didn't you? His father's 90, Simon, and he was going to be here, but he wasn't feeling very well. Also a preacher. And so his son, Noel, took over for that Sunday, and I think he did a great job on, on trust. So there's a high bar that those two have set for me for next week, but there we go. And Simon, okay, three weeks. What are you talking all right, I'm going to pray the benediction. Then we're going to get up and we're going to worship for just a little bit. Benediction says this, and I want you to take this to heart. You go nowhere by accident. And it was so evident when Gabby and I were in Italy meeting with her family. Um, we don't go there by, we didn't go there by accident. We went on assignment for God. Wherever you go, God is sending you there. He has a purpose in uh, you being there. Christ who indwells you is something He wants to do through you wherever you are. The Holy Spirit who guides and leads you will show you things to come. Be open to His leading today. Believe this. Go in His grace and love and power. In the name of Him who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He's our anchor. He's our hope for tomorrow. With all this chaos out there in the world, I don't know how people survive without Jesus. But we have a living, risen Savior. Let's worship. <laughs>